Good morning, Water's Edge. Welcome to Church Online. If you're visiting with us today, we're just thrilled that you're here. Um, you can log in and you can chat with us or you can pray. Um, all kinds of options. You can give everything right on this portal. Um, but first off, I just want to wish you a happy Memorial Day weekend. You know, Memorial Day never really meant anything to me um, until I got married. And then my husband's family um, has a tradition of marching and they lay wreaths and lay flags um, at the different locations, cemeteries around uh, their county. And so when I got married, Memorial Day became this um, early morning kind of honoring of those that have given their lives in service to our country. And it finally started to mean something. And um, now our kids remember going, they, they talk about the gun salutes and grandpa and uncles and friends that are in uniform and why it even got to throw the wreath into the river to commemorate those that were lost at sea. So I just want you, as you are enjoying hopefully some wonderful weather and maybe some barbecuing and grilling and beach time, um, to take some time and remember those that um, have given their lives as a sacrifice for us to be able to live in this amazing country and um, have the freedoms that we do have. So happy Memorial Day. Thank those that are in service that you know and mem remember those that we have lost. And we're gonna open up this morning. I'm gonna pray and we're gonna do some singing. Father God, I thank you for, first and foremost, those, Father, that have agreed to fight for our freedom, who are in the military currently, Lord God, and who have been in the military in the past, Lord. Um, it, is, it is their bravery and their sacrifice that allows us to live so freely. And on this very special weekend, Lord God, I pray that um, those families that have lost loved ones, that they can feel your peace, that they can feel your love and your strength, as I'm sure it's difficult to continue to remember those that they loved that are no longer with them. And Lord, just let us continue <clears throat> always to be thankful. Thankful for those that um, serve for this country. Thankful for the relationships that you have put into our lives. Thankful for friendships that we have made and continue to grow stronger, Lord. And especially, Father, just continuing to be thankful for you and who you are. And so I pray that as we sing this morning, Lord, that we focus on the amazing things, the blessings that you have bestowed on us and our whole church family, Lord God. Even though times are tough right now, there are blessings every single day, Lord. And so let us turn our attention towards those things this morning. I pray all this, Lord God, in your son's holy name. Amen. We're going to sing about that amazing God who can do miracles in our lives, who loves us so much that he just wants to have a relationship with us. What are you turning into wine? Open the eyes of the light. There's no one like you. None darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is He. darkness into the 
darkness you shine, yes you do, Lord. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. No. Yeah. <laughs>
Grant. You want to give me a hand putting this flag up? Maybe later. Actually, I'd love to. And here I thought guys your age just wanted to talk about girls and face Graham on Insta Twitter. So close, Grandpa. So close. So, uh, where's this flag going? Out front, like always. But there's already a flag out front. Yeah, this is true. So, two flags? Grandpa, this isn't a double rainbow thing, is it? One flag is enough, don't you think? What's a double rainbow thing? You know, the video where he's in his backyard and he can't understand why there's two rainbows and... You just kind of have to see it. To answer your question, I'm swapping the flags out. One out front, I fly you around. But this one, it's just for today. How come? Okay, this is one of those moments you wait for. It may as well be a neon sign. It says, dispense wisdom here. So what do I say to my grandson, whose generation seems more interested in selfies and sacrifice? What do I tell him about this flag? Come on. So, I fly this one every day just to remind myself. Of what? Of all those men and women who serve us, who protect us every day. Usually without much thanks, without anybody even noticing how much they sacrifice. I don't want to forget that. So I fly this one to honor those men and women. Okay, I get that, but why this fly today? Well, I fly this particular flag to honor a buddy of mine, a guy I served with. Do I know him? No. I wish you could have. So what makes you want to honor him? Because he didn't come home. just as easily could have been me. I don't want to forget that. I don't want to forget any of the men and women who didn't get to come home. You know, sacrifice is not something you forget, Grant. So, that's why this particular flag on this particular day You know what? You do it. Me? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can you hold my phone? Sure. I think we just need to be reminded and sing some songs about um, Christ's resurrection. I forget sometimes that um, my battles, though they are struggling, difficult, hard, all of those things when I'm going through them, that the victory of this world is already won. And so I love to sing Easter songs all year round. Um, because it's in Christ's name, in his power, that we have the victory today no matter what our struggles are. We can claim his name, claim him as our savior, and live in his strength and his power. So I hope that you can sing this song um, and that you can, as a child of God, celebrate that you are also resurrected. The hair that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The 
Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who bore our sin and shame now robed in majesty. The radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see. In his name. Your name, your name is victory. Your praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name.
praise you, Jesus. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited for today's sermon. Uh, happy Memorial Day weekend. I hope you're being able to take some time off, but I'm excited for today's sermon because I get to preach about one of the very familiar books of the Bible. Uh, we're in this series called Minor Prophets, where we are going over the books of the Old Testament that are considered to be minor prophets. To, to review a little bit from last week, the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, is broken into three sections. You have the Torah, which is the law. You have the Nevi'im, or the prophets, which is where we are, and you have the ketuvim, which is the writings. And then you have the prophets is also broken down into three sections. You have the former prophets like Samuel, uh, and you have the major prophets like Isaiah, and, and, and then you have where we are, which is the minor prophets. So we are going over these 12 books of the Bible called the minor prophets. Prophets. The minor prophets are interesting to study because their stories are just very different. Uh, the, the books are mostly very short, uh, but they have these big messages. So today we are going to study the book of Jonah, which if you grew up in church at all, even if you didn't grow up in church, you've probably heard of the story of Jonah. Um, if you did grow up in the church, you know this story from Sunday school. It's a kid's ministry favorite because it's all about a prophet who doesn't follow God. And then he gets swallowed up by this giant fish. Uh, and that's the kid Ver, you know, the kid-friendly version, and, and it's a really fun story, but taking a look at this story as an adult, there are some great themes and messages for us today. So, let's dive right in. As I was studying this week, I was reminded of the long-standing debate about whether or not Jonah is real, um, <laughs> or if Jonah was a real person. Uh, now, I can tell you that Jonah is definitely a real person. We also read about him in the book of 2 Kings, which is a much more historical kind of book. Um, the, the book of Jonah, though, it's very different. It's a very different kind of book. It's written to tell a story. It's very narrative. Uh, there are exaggerations and hyperboles. The, the characters of the story are caricatures of the people of the day. At one point in the story, the king of Nineveh, he calls on all of the people that lived in that town to repent, but not only the people, but also the livestock to repent. Um, his decree calls for the animals to all wear wear sackcloth and ash and 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 now because of these things and and, and because of uh, how I want to tell the story today um, I, I want to kind of encourage you to think about this book maybe as one of these books that we need to read a little bit differently today <laughs> we're gonna read it completely differently and I want us to consider that this book at least for today might be a work of satire so Old Testament ancient satire, but satire nonetheless. Okay, let, let's go through the story and you'll start to see what I'm talking about. Um, so as we're going through this, I want you to pay close attention to the characters of the story. The book of Jonah starts off with God speaking to Jonah the prophet and telling him what to do. God says that Jonah is to go to Nineveh, which is a town in Assyria, and preach against it because they have sinned. They have been wicked. Now, Jonah's a prophet. Jonah's hearing from God. God has given a prophet something to proclaim. How this normally goes is the prophet would then go and proclaim that. And so that's what we would kind of expect would happen. That's what prophets do. It's literally their job. But what does Jonah do? Jonah runs away. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to fulfill his duties as prophet. Now, in this part of the story, we aren't told why Jonah doesn't want to go, only that he goes down to the port and he books a boat heading in the exact opposite direction as Nineveh. He sails for Tarshish. So, Bona bo Jonah boards this boat, he goes inside, and he goes to sleep. A huge storm comes up on the sea, and we meet some of the other characters of this story. Now, uh, the, the sailors, and, and now when you imagine a sailor, do you imagine a sweet, God-loving type of person? 
No. In fact, there are parts of our own vernacular in modern times that we use to denote something being bad because of how stereotypical most sailors are. Uh, generally, we say you cuss like a sailor. That's right. Um, but generally, when, when, when people, you know, so, but people think that sailors are always drinking or drunk, that once they come ashore, they're womanizers, and they're lazy because they can't hold a normal job, so they have to be sailors. Now, I'm not saying this is every sailor, I'm just saying, like, this is the stereotype. But in the story of Jonah, this huge storm comes up, and it's a storm like they've never seen before, and the sailors start to get afraid. And what do they immediately do? Well, these sailors, they immediately start to call out on to their gods. And when that didn't work, they woke up Jonah and told him to call out on his god for help. And, and, and through doing all this, they figured out that this storm was happening because Jonah was running away from God. Jonah told them to throw him into the sea. And they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to have his blood on their hands. And so they tried rowing to sh shore first. Uh, they, and when, and they, they tried casting off the cargo to make the ship lighter. They basically tried everything and everything failed. They finally agreed, reluctantly agreed to toss Jonah overboard. And as they did, they asked God not to. To, to hold his life on their, they didn't want his blood on their hands. They didn't want to be responsible for the death of Jonah. So we have this prophet who's running away from God. And we have these sailors who are typically really far away from God, like immediately going towards God and, and going towards who God is. And so from the outset, you have these characters of the story, and, and, and they are going against what you would think. Now, we all know what happens next. The sailors, they, they beg God not to hold Jonah's blood on their hands, and they throw him overboard. By the way, if you think about this request of Jonah, this is also another really selfish thing that he does. He knows what he's supposed to do, but he's not willing to do it himself. He doesn't want to follow what God wants of him so much that he would rather die than go and proclaim God's word to the Ninevites. It's crazy. But the sailors, so they, they throw him overboard and the storm immediately calms down. And then a giant fish comes up and swallows Jonah. Now, all that is chapter one of the book of Jonah. There's four chapters in the book of Jonah. All that happens in chapter one. Chapter two is a prayer to God from Jonah. Now, if you go and you read it, we're not going to read it here, but if you go and you read it, what's interesting about this prayer is that Jonah acknowledges who God is. Jonah proclaims who God is and, 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 and proclaims that God, God is loving and that God has saved him, but he never apologizes for what he's done. Jonah, does, this is not a prayer of repentance. It's, it's more of a prayer of praise to who God is. Jonah obviously knows what he's done. He knows what he's done is wrong, but he does not repent. So after the prayer, the, the fish vomits up Jonah on dry land, and that is chapter two. Chapter three is Jonah finally going to Nineveh. Uh, but just like in chapter one, the sailors, we see, you know, you know, with the sailors, we see some pretty incredible things happen with the people that Jonah is preaching to. First of all, we have to understand that Nineveh during this time is described as being a, an incredibly wicked place. Nineveh was always a part of the Assyrian empire and considered to be full of just bad people. And, and there was no Jewish presence at this time. Like there were not Jewish people living in Nineveh. So Jonah had no reason to love this town. He had no reason to love these people. Also, the descriptions of Nineveh in Jonah, um, Jonah calls it a great city and, and that it would take three days to walk across it. If, and, and if you go and you like do some research, that is definitely an exaggeration. Nineveh has never been that large, but from what we can gather, 
a lot of people did live there. And people, these people, Jonah did not like. So Jonah walks into this city and he preaches probably the shortest sermon ever. Here's what he says. Jonah walks a day into the city and he says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. That's the whole sermon. In Hebrew, it's exactly five words. Jonah goes in and he speaks, he proclaims five words. Jonah has been asked by God to go and to proclaim God's word to the Ninevites. And so technically, technically, he's done that. But he's done the absolute bare minimum that he had to do. And, but, I want, but what I want to read to you now is the response. Jonah goes to the city, the city he doesn't want to go to. He proclaims five words. Here's the response of the Ninevites. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least in the city, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered in sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. I don't know what evil things the cows were doing, but he, you know, the king is proclaiming they need to stop it. And so who knows, the king of Nineveh says, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And then the very end of chapter three here says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So, couple of things in here. First, the king of Nineveh declares a fast, but not just for the people, but also the animals. He wants all the people and animals to be covered in sackcloth. I don't know what kind of clothes the animals in Nineveh were wearing at the time, how, how fashionable they were, but, but they had to replace those clothes with sackcloth. I Honestly, people read the Old Testament, read the Bible. It's funny in times. And so, uh, and, I, and I just, I, I love that thought. The other thing though, the most important, the more important thing to notice though, is the extent to which these wicked and awful people, awful people, how they responded to God. Much like the sailors in the story, they came around incredibly quickly to God. And not just a little, they turned from their ways. They repented. They wore sackcloth. They declared a fast for the whole city. It's an incredible response, especially considering how wicked these people supposedly were. Then at the end of chapter 3, we see God's mercy. God had originally declared that this city was going to be destroyed because of their great sin. But at the end, we see that God relented and decided not to bring destruction against Nineveh. So, that's chapter three. And if the story ended right there, Jonah would be this awesome story of God's grace and mercy. But that's not where Jonah ends. We have chapter four. I don't know if you've ever read chapter four, but it's, it's, it's kind of cool. So in chapter four in the NIV, it has this title, this title. Jonah's anger at the Lord's compassion. That's the title of the chapter. Jonah's anger at the Lord's compassion. And, and, and we finally get to know why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. We get to figure out why Jonah ran away. Here's what Jonah says. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That I, this is, that, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing tar to Tarshish. Sorry. I'm going to start that again. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I was trying to forestall when I was fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
Jonah is mad at God because God decided not to destroy Nineveh. Jonah would rather die than to see mercy on those people over there. God then asks a very pertinent question to Jonah. He says, is it right for you to be angry? God is asking if Jonah's anger is justified, if all those people really need to die. And Jonah's answer, not by word, but by his actions is, yes, yes, they do. Remember, this is supposed to be a man of God. This is supposed to be the prophet. This is supposed to be someone that is a representative of God. You would think that he of all people would understand. He even says that he understands how God, how God is compassionate and gracious. Jonah just refuses to live his life that way. So Jonah sits down outside the city like a toddler all in a huff. And he's going to sit there and he's going to wait and see what happens to the city. Because you, you, and you can just see his thought process. Maybe they'll mess up. Maybe God will destroy them after all. And, and as Jonah is sitting there, God makes a plant grow. And this plant, it grows big and tall and it actually covers Jonah's head. And it, it gives shade to Jonah. And it brings him comfort. And in and, 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 and Jonah 4 it says that Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God called, caused a worm to come and to begin to eat the roots of the plant so that the plant withers and dies. And we see Jonah's anger uh, arise for a second time, and Jonah asks again for God to kill him. And then the book of Jonah, it ends with God again asking Jonah, are you right to be angry about the plant? And God points out that Jonah cares more for this plant than he does all the people and all the animals in Nineveh. But we don't get a response from Jonah. The book just ends right there. So that's the book of Jonah. This is probably one of the better books in the Bible to read through and to ask the question, what do I do with this information? How am I supposed to read this? How am I supposed to interpret this? Uh, because this book is, it's so much more than just history. This book is actually written for a purpose. This book has a strong message for us today. And that message, it centers around the main character of Jonah. Jonah is a prophet. Jonah is a person who follows God. Jonah represents all of us who follow God. And, and, but throughout this entire book, he doesn't act like a man of God should act. Jonah runs away. Jonah does the bare minimum he's supposed to do to reach out to the Ninevites. And, and, and he wears his anger on his sleeve. Why? Because he doesn't like these people. He considers these people his enemy. And you know what? He might be right. In fact, he's probably right. But the fact is the king of Nineveh could have come down and destroyed all of Jonah's family himself. And it wouldn't change the meaning of this book. Because what the book of Jonah is doing is it's teaching us about who God is. It's teaching us something about what God is like. And so what we see is that this book, it confronts us with a God who is willing to love, willing to be gracious to people that may not deserve it. Our God is willing to forgive them of their sin, even if we don't think that they deserve it. So this book, it shows us this God that is loving and compassionate and gracious, and then it holds up this mirror right to the person that's reading it, and it asks the question, are you okay with this? Are you good with this? Are you okay with a God that will forgive your enemies? Are you okay with a God that loves your enemies? Notice, it's not Jonah that ends the book, but it's God pointing us to the question, is it right for you to be more upset by something that has little meaning? 
than for you to not care for all those you don't appreciate in the world. I love how this book makes no bones about how there are going to be people in this world that you don't get along with. It makes no excuses. It provides no context for how we are supposed to get along with everyone and hold hands and sing Kumbaya with them. And instead, this book, it drives right to the heart and it's designed for you and for me to consider who would be the Ninevites in our lives. Who would be those people that we harbor anger towards? Who would be those people that you don't like? And if you had the all-powerful God on your side, would you be okay if that God decided to love them just the same as God loves you? It's a powerful statement. It's a powerful message. It's one that I think a lot of people in our world and culture need to hear today. In this moment, we are very good, and, and I say the collective we, are very good at creating us and them dynamics in our culture. We all the time we'll figure out how, how, how to create like things that we like and, and, and attribute that to us. And, 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 and we, at the same time, we, we take all the things that we don't like and we attribute it to those people over there that we don't like. And so it just further creates this divide between us. We, we like to draw that line of distinction. Uh, we, we like to say that we are us and they are them over there. And, and we don't like those people. We don't associate with those people over there. You stay over there and I'll stay over here. You have your group and I have my group, us, them. But what God is telling us, and he's telling us all, is that God doesn't work that way. I don't work that way. Our God is the God of the entire cosmos. All people are God's people. Even in a time where there, like this time, the time of Jonah, where there was a chosen people of God, and, and, you know, this is back in Old Testament times when Israel was God's special people. God is saying through the book of Jonah, I care about all people. My memory is longer than yours. Uh, my mem I can remember when they were born. I can remember when their grandfather's grandfather was born and how uh, uh, of an amazing person that they were. You see, it's not only you that has a special place in my heart, but it's everyone. So this week, uh, it's time for us to ask ourselves, are we okay with that? Are we okay with a God? that can love our enemies way more than, or not way more, but just the same as God loves us. It's time for us to let God work in our hearts to change our perspective to who God is. Because if we're going to follow God, if we're going to follow this God of Jonah, Jonah, it's teaching us to be something larger than ourselves, to be something different than normal. Us and them, that's normal. But God is a God of all. That's the message of Jonah. Let's pray. God, we all know that you love us. But God, help us to know that you also love them. Help us to know that that whether we find ourselves on one side or the other side of the aisle, whether, whether we find ourselves in competing uh, businesses in a community, wh whether we see, find ourselves competing with other people, God, help us to realize that we are all your children and that your calling is, for, is, is to be love and grace and mercy and that, God, you, you are calling us to show that same love and mercy that you show to all people all over history, all over the world, all over our communities today. God, I thank you that you are a gracious God. I thank you that you are a loving God. God, I thank you that, that your mercy is here for us because, God, we need it so bad. God, help us to follow you, to walk in your ways, to know who you are. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, friends, as we close up today, I just want to leave you with two simple things. The first one is that God loves you so, so much. 
He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to um, better your life and fill it with blessings and be able to answer your prayers and and um, all of those amazing things when that you get when you can call yourself a child of God. But the other thing about God's love is that we have to admit that we need it. You know, we can we can get through this life on our own. We can struggle and we can work really hard and and we can um, accomplish some great things without the help of our Lord. But that's not the path or the plan that he has for us. And so sometimes we have to stop and we have to say, Lord, I need you. I, I may not think it, I may not want to admit it right in this more moment, but I need you. And so I hope that those are the words that are going to resonate as we close up today through the rest of your week.
took a breath and you breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found Still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me Mountain you won't climb up coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie won't tear down coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. church sing it out friends you just go and just live in that love we love you as well god bless